I, I thought we had some really, really interesting ideas there, and I guess I, I wonder whether or not there isn't a, a way forward which is a combination of both metropolitan and local ideas. And, and Mark, you said that local government doesn't go away, and neither does strategic, broader, big picture planning, or does it? Uh, yes, I, I, I need to come clean on, on those issues. Um, the coalition government rolled out localism as an alternative to regionalism. Um, it needn't be, uh, but the, you know, the Labour Party's constituents are at regional level. So when the first thing they did when they came into office was ab abolish regional planning and strategic planning, except in London. Um, whether that's got something to do with the fact that there's a Conservative mayor, uh, I don't know. Um, but they kept the regional structure for London but abolished it elsewhere. And localism then was viewed as an alternative to, as they said, the top-down imposition of a Stalinist planning system. Um, it needn't be that way. It, localism could work nested with strategic levels quite easily and uh, the opposition parties are looking at retaining localism but resourcing it properly uh, and also thinking about the strategic needs uh, beyond that. So um, uh, that, that's just, just to clarify. On the issue of municipal government, um, municipal government, local government still exists in the UK, but it's starved. Um, in the UK, 70% of local government's resources come from central taxation. Uh, we don't have a federal system, and the government is reducing its contribution uh, by as much as 30 to 40% uh, over uh, an eight year period. And uh, they are not allowing local government to raise taxation. To, to fill that gap. So local government in the UK is being transformed, uh, certainly in England, not in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland under devolution, uh, but it's been transformed. Uh, in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, the city council is looking at 190 million pounds worth of cuts in the next four years. There will be no face-to-face -face contact in local government in the future. It will all be digital. Uh, and that's because there's a need. That's the only way they can, they can uh, operate. And you can imagine the implications for public services uh, as a result of that. Um, so localism sits uneasy in that context. Um, uh, it might change, but actually I think it's local government that's paying for the crisis uh, caused by the banking uh, profession uh, six years ago. John. Uh, Mark, I've got a question. Um, the neighbourhood plans that are prepared under localism, how many of them have been prepared actually? What, what actually are they? What do the local neighbourhoods actually prepare? And how many are there? The reason I ask is that I had a talk the other day. I heard that actually there have only been about four produced and they have been produced in wealthy, uh, quite sophisticated parts of London, in fact. So I'm just really, I, 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 but that may be a different thing from what you're talking about. Uh, there are something like 150 neighbourhood plans at the present time, but they have to go through a fairly convoluted adoption process because it was designed by Whitehall, after all, um, and that involves uh, a test of conformity with the municipal's existing plan and importantly, central government's national planning policy framework. And the national planning policy framework is just a few pages, but basically says economic growth and housing development are great. Um, we ignore everything else. So of course, they have, all the plans have to be in conformity with that and they are uh, required to say yes to development. They have to go through an inspector's review, examination. Uh, that delays the process, so I think Exactly, yeah, it's, it's become totally bureaucratic and the communities are resent, resentful of that process. There's no need for it to be, uh, but of course central government never withdraws from the picture. It just reinvents itself and in this case it's reinvented itself to take on the conformity check-in uh, role. So there are 150 of them, but not all have been adopted because a lot of them have failed the test of conformity. The public have had the audacity to want to do something totally different to the government's agenda and on that basis they've been rejected 
and sent back to the drawing board. So um, it depends which one you pick up. Um, some of them could be, actually, uh, London, is, that's not the case. They, they, are, they have failed in London uh, because there's simply no agreement about uh, what shape they take or the agenda to take on. Um, it's rural areas that, that have had the adoptions and uh, they address things like finding sites for six homes uh, in the village. Uh, it's, it's that radical. So, <laughs> that was very, very good. Uh, and you're all dreaming. <laughs> so, uh, let me take them in order, in order to challenge, because it's very, very good stuff. And the risk is that we sleepwalk our way into thinking that it's all possible. And as somebody once said, for every complex problem, there is a simple solution, and they're all wrong. So in the UK, it took five years of very bad local town hall chaos to arrive at a series of B-grade solutions. You called quite rightly, Mark, for universities to play a role. We also know in Australia, totally different than the UK, I'm sure, in Australia that largely universities, with the exception of the University of New South Wales, of course, what we need is we need universities to be engaged and not lost in the esotericism of yeah, academia. Yeah, we need policymakers to be engaged in a way that we know that they can create impact, not just another framework to be, measure nothing against. And we need practitioners to be involved in a way that is not just lost in their own guilt. Equally, we see Marcus Spiller mounting a powerful case for localism, which actually argues for centralism, because essentially what I heard was as long as it's the capital cities, you're fine, but forget Bathurst, Orange, Wollongong, and the rest of them. So if you're up in the north of New South Wales, you're stuffed. And if we want a fast train between the major centres, you can forget it. And then I heard uh, Luca Belgiano Nettis outline a remarkable new model that is um, at risk of, and I've experienced being shanghai by a Premier and a Deputy Premier in another state who were essentially at war with each other and used new democracy as a way to mediate the middle. My point to all this is, it's all technically possible and we all have the skill and wit to do so. We all have the reach to the research that proves it can be done. And so you why all... Ex huh? Why not do it? It is the, aren't we arguing about the 1% which is essentially the mechanics of the middle? It's not whether it's top down or bottom up. It's not whether it's central or whether it's local. It's how the hell we do that bit that is the shade in between, which is that 1% where we are falling off the cliff between the top down that is almost right and generally well, well driven and well intentioned. And the bottom up, which is again a lot more intelligent than we often give it credit for, but often lacks the agency to make any impact whatsoever. So the number of times that we meet in the town hall with blank post-it notes and we look at aspirations that go nowhere for a project which is related to site, not place. And aren't we arguing about the 1%? And don't we need to find our gaze to how that one, the 1% 1 of the mechanics of the middle actually work? Don't we need to move away from expertise to integration? And how would we do that? Can I say that uh, my, my father-in-law, who was out from Italy recently, told me he's an 88-year-old, and he said, look, the best men are those who have got the biggest ideals. So we might be dreaming, Tim, but, you know, you've got to start dreaming to start with, right? So uh, I think there is a... I, I said, the economist said, there is an existential crisis. M Mark has talked about it. Minister, with all due respect, there is problematic trust issue with the political establishment. How do we rebuild that trust? Because it doesn't matter what the town planners say. I mean, this is a very political issue. It doesn't matter who says anything about this. You can say something, another town planner will say something else. You know, a politician will say something different. You know, the, the other party will say something different, guaranteed. You've got to build trust. That's the biggest issue. I don't think it's about the one percent. I'm, I'm, I am. Uh, I think our uh, 
democracy for the city is profoundly um, broken. Um, the, the arrangements that we have, the co very concentrated form of democracy that we have in our country served us well, you know, as I said before, when it didn't really, when you didn't really need to do it very well. Uh, but we are out, we, we have a profoundly divided city, particularly Sydney and Melbourne, but, but, uh, but also Brisbane and, and some of the other metropolitan areas. I, I actually agree with much of what Luca has said but I disagree with the idea that um, political struggle has gone away or that class struggle has gone away. We may not have the traditional labour and capital struggle, but we have a profoundly divided metropolis between those who are in the comfortable, um, privileged knowledge economy, like here, which I'm, thank God, every day I'm part of. <laughs> and, and I do, I really do, I, I feel, I'm a working class boy, also of Italian background from Carlton, so I'm very, very conscious of it. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, so I have a, a bit of an issue with what Luke is saying in that I don't think it's a question of, um, uh, of just giving uh, citizens randomly selected an opportunity to come up with a solution to all problems. I don't think you can talk about democracy without factoring in political class struggle into it. That's my very point. Yeah, okay. Uh, and the other thing is, you can't talk about democracy without talking about subsidiarity. So, you know, do you pull together a citizen's jury to decide whether we go to war, war in Iraq? I mean, maybe it makes sense to develop a local plan, but there are some issues to do with a community that rises above the local community and the metropolitan community and the state community where you do, we do entrust our political representatives to make, we, we, we deserve a discourse with them, but at the end of the day, we look to those people to make a decision. So, uh, but at the metropolitan area, we have no such forum. So I don't think it's just a one percenter there. It's, uh, it's more like 90%. What have we done either in the regions? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, the same. Which is that, that yeah, yeah. it's fine because I've, uh, you know, and there are issues in New South Wales where electricity networks and so forth have used the new democracy model. But the, these are arguably, what we've heard tonight is, a, is an argument for major centre centralism no. through the model of devolution and localism. But why can't we have... In the same way, if we have a metropolitan commission, why can't we have regional commissions with similar scope of powers? There's no, there's no problem with creating four, five, 20 levels of government. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have a look at the US system. You know, they have spheres of government, governance around areas, but also around functions. And you know, LA is putting in a major metro system uh, based on a public transport jurisdiction and they made a decision to raise their own sales taxes to fund it. But anyway, I just wanted to jump in and, uh, and provide some, um, a tip to the minister because I've, I've worked for ministers. And <laughs> you, the, the most important thing you can do is find somebody else to blame in planning because I think the, the worst thing that's happened in, it's certainly in Victoria with the dismantling of the Melbourne Metropolitan Board of Works, which was a sort of a semi-democratic regional planning body, and there's no reason why you can't have them for the non-metropolitan regions. Uh, the worst thing that the Labor government did in the 80s was bring that function into the centre of government and all of a sudden made the, the minister the chief town planner for the state. So every damn thing that goes wrong in the suburbs, it's the minister's fault. The best thing you can do is put it at arm's length and the second best thing you can do is have some sort of a democratic mandate for it. As long it. as it's controllable. Oh yeah, as long as it's, it's ultimately, ultimately ratified by the state. Sure, absolutely. But, um, you know, the, the Cumberland County Council wasn't too far off the mark. You know, I think, uh, going back to the Minister's point, you're right that um, the middle tier is, is the problem here. Um, because all that localism and neighbourhood uh, planning has done is insert another lower tier and then local government becomes the middle tier that they had just abolished by getting rid of the regional tier. Um, and since 1945, we've experimented in order with centralism, localism, regionalism, metropolitanism, city regionalism, localism, regionalism, and now localism again, uh, depend on who's in office um, and depend where their constituency interests are. The trouble is the more 
tiers we've created, or ad hoc tiers, because it's not sometimes they're, they're informal, the more there's a need for integration. And the more there's a need for integration, the more you spend all your time knocking heads together and not actually getting on with the job in question. And thus the problem of governance. The problem of mixing government with governance is that you spend all your time trying to work out who has legitimacy to do what and where the accountability um, uh, lies. I think what we need to think about is that there are different types of democracy and different types of systems that are needed to address our urban and regional problems. Some of it will rely on the ballot box of national elections. Some of it could embrace more community-centered forms of engagement. But everyone is aware in advance where the parameters lie or where the limits of discretion and democracy lie for what they're doing. They don't try and claim uh, democratic mandate from other tiers where there are other layers of responsibility and power. These things can be nested together, but at least be upfront with people about what the limits and rights are. We have three questions now, um, or comments. Mine was really a question of the panel. <clears throat> it's around limits, it's also, um, Around that question, you said, what do we do if we have to go to war? Do we ask 21 citizens who are first in the door? So um, I can imagine it all working, but could it work, in your views, um, if there's, there's strong policy guidance around fundamental principles? So we have some big issues around a more sustainable, lower carbon economy, for example. And then, if you like, um, clearly articulated limits, to use your word, around what the conversation can be about. And, and that, to me, if it's placemaking, is around the public domain. And so there are other things that are, if you like, um, involving a high degree of freedom at a citizen level around the private domain, providing it doesn't disrupt or undermine the public domain. So under that scenario, could all, of, all three of your ideas um, be a platform for making that work? I've got um, misgivings, or I've got some doubts about the practicality of setting the, the envelope and then letting the local citizens rip kind of thing. And, and I you know, probably sound like a scratch record, but uh, we have screwed up the democracy, the federation, by having the Commonwealth too strong. Now, the relation between that and your question is this that we've set up uh, a, a culture and a, um, a community that is so tied to its housing wealth that it will not brook interference in the local community. So, you know, what, what is the battleground in our cities? It's about creating density. It's about creating more housing opportunities in the privileged core that we all probably live in. And um, we have conditioned those communities to completely resist that. Now, you know, maybe if we, if, if we talk, if we allowed them to talk with each other um, in, a, in a respectful way with support from professions, they'd come to their senses. But that's where I think the struggle and politics comes into it. I think that it's, 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 it, it won't be solved through that kind of process. That's my gut feeling, to be honest. But I think what Alec is suggesting is that if, the, if there is a hierarchy of, of decision making and, fra and a framework around some decisions about increasing density and yeah. uh, increasing housing opportunities, and that the citizen jury had a more limited yeah. role about how that would be implemented, could that work? In theory, but what if you went into a local community like... Karinga. You know, a North Shore, yeah, yeah, North Shore uh, municipality. I know said, them well. So long as you've tripled your density, um, you can decide whatever you want to do. I mean, you'd get howled down, would you? Oh, no, I, I no. actually. Um, oh, you don't think so? Oh, well, that's good, that's encouraging. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't say I don't know. I, I have no idea what happened in Karinga, but I just want to make the point that there yeah. would have to be, otherwise, you've got yeah, the Iraq I question. Agree. And then on top of that, the community, the burgers of Karinga, can't talk about what's on their private property. They have to talk about the outcome on the street, on the parks, yeah. on the rail system and all the rest of it. I, 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 yeah. I, I, yes, can Luca. I just respond? Yeah. You know, 
I don't want to sound simplistic in these exercises because, of course, you know, when you're talking about the community, you know, what is the community? Is it Karingai? Is it Sydney? Is it the state? Is it the country? You know, I, I think you can, you can make representative groups for all of that and more, as you wish. I, I have a simple definition about democracy, and democracy is just is a way of organising ourselves for no other reason but, guess what, for ourselves. So at, however we want to organise ourselves is up to us. But don't think that... Well, it's, it's, it's just... It's, it's kind of... It's uh, disingenuous to think that us experts can figure it out. Why should we, what, what, why are we sort of taking away, introducing that step? Give it to the community directly to understand what they think they would want to do. Now, of course, if you say, here, Karingai, do what you want to do here. This is your, we're only looking at the community in Karingai and it's only the good burgers at Karingai who are coming together and saying what they want to do with their, their, their community. Well, of course, they'll think about not necessarily spoiling it with super density or whatever. But if you broaden it, then you might have a different conversation. It's only natural. Now we have a couple of other comments, questions. Um, Bruce, next. Are you OK? Um, Mark, maybe not for the core discussion, maybe after, but I'm interested in the Tesco story because five, six years ago, they were the darlings of corporate social responsibility with emissions reporting and things like that. And sustainability. And, yeah. all, all of those things. And look, um, Marcus, you didn't have to bring slides because Lucas was so beautiful in their, in their imagery. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but have you had an issue, because Marcus alluded to, maybe the process that you're running in deliberative democracy citizens jury where the experts are the evidence base for the collaboration of the randomly selected. Have you seen an issue that you haven't been able to resolve to a point that you think it provides that there, opinion? There's a, there's a number of issues. I mean, in the States they had a... I'm not sure which state it was, but they had a deliberative forum uh, uh, of, of randomly selected citizens discussing what to do with marijuana legislation. And they, 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 they couldn't agree. It was basically 50-50, something like that. There is no, this, is, this is not a panacea for solutions, but it is a way of building trust, that's all. But something I heard today, so, was someone said to me, Facts don't speak for themselves, they're like a sack, they don't stand up unless something's with them. Okay, and I, I was thinking, Marcus, you mentioned that maybe it might not work for some of the bigger brush issues at a metropolitan government scale. But you talked also about the silos, and we've seen the silos, whether that's been under the five names of the Department of Planning that I experienced with the three DGs and the seven ministers or whatever it was. Silo things happened. A process that Luca might run, or his group might run, would still come up with a decision about integrated land use and transport planning, I think, you know, at a guess, okay. In your model, at the first point you said they would advise the government on that yeah. issue. Yeah. You said later on when the, maybe the government of the day has confidence with that, they'll devolve more power. Yeah. I am interested in, maybe so it doesn't fail first up, how you would capture the ability to give res regard to those decisions. Because the little bit I've been involved with the new democracy stuff, we were going to be the evidence base or some of the evidence base for botany. The mayor wanted to do something with that, we're engaged, but he got rolled. Yeah. And I think his interpretation, or my interpretation of our discussion is that the other four Labor councillors, because I think it's an all Labor council, said, but we're the decision makers on here and we don't need this group, we are the democracy. Yeah. So I just wonder yeah. if you've got some comments on yeah, that, look, Marcus. Look, yeah. just, I've got a very practical answer to that. I think the trick lies in setting up a commission, the absolute trick lies in making sure there are elected uh, councillors sitting on the governing board of it, but not in the majority. So I've, I'm trying to tell the, anybody that will stand still and listen down in Victoria, get rid of the technocrats on the board of the Metropolitan Planning Authority and replace it with one elected um, councillor from each of the sub-regions of Melbourne, that would give them four or five, and make sure you, you balance it up with, you know, state government appointees. Now, why is that so important? Who might be technocrats? Who might be technocrats? In fact, they would be from the various uh, uh, infrastructure arms of, of government. Now, picture the Karingai situation in that case. You know, from a metropolitan point of view, you want to densify strongly there. 
if the good burgers of, I'm talking about political management here, if the good burgers of, of Karingai uh, uh, object, they no longer have the easy, softest target in the world, which is to go to Macquarie Street and, and or, or, hit or, or, or hit the bureaucrats. They now have to conduct a political fight with their co-citizens across the metropolitan area. They have to stand in a forum and say, well, hang on, we're all part of the metropolitan community here, but somehow we should be exempted from that. It's much easier for them to prosecute that political case when they're arguing with the state government. That's why it's important to have at least the semblance of a, democracy, a democratically elected representatives for the metropolitan area. Now, if it works, you can ramp it up, but it's a pretty low cost, no regrets approach. And so just some of your reflection given the role that you played. In effect, you were effectively seeking a statutory licence to think strategically at a regional level. Yeah. Where would you stand now on that approach versus a Metropolitan Commission or how that might fit and dovetail with it? Well, well, I was naive enough to think, and Marcus and I have talked about this a lot, to disagree with him and to say that the state government can in fact represent the Metropolitan Government. if it has an ability to set up a structure that ena enables it to do that. So I, I, that's where I sat. I've now changed my mind. I think that actually what Marcus is talking about is, has a lot of um, validity, but I'm working in my own mind on a planning system that actually mixes up all of the things we've been talking about today. Um, and, not no, and one of the things that Plan First did that the most recent reforms didn't do is to acknowledge that you don't have a template which is one size fits all, but that you do allow local communities to develop local character statements and through a local, local area, it doesn't really matter as long as the big picture issues are resolved and the local community knows the, the constraints within which they have the authority to plan for their own area. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's what I think is so fascinating about all of this, is, is the, the way in which we can mix those things. But I definitely would not be abandoning broader regional metropolitan um, strategic planning. You know, there, there are variations of the model here. I mean, the coalition government rolled out localism, implemented it as a centralist uh, model, all communities are going to get it, whether they want it or not. In my part of the world, in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, there's no neighbourhood group um, because the citizens believe in the role of the local state and they're not interested in taking the power. Uh, and the Conservatives just can't understand it. You know? They say, well, we, we rely on our elected representatives, we trust them. Um, so, uh, th you know, that's a strange anomaly perhaps, but it needn't be a rolled out top down form of localism. Um, localism already exists in the form of constituencies of interest, but maybe they don't have access to decision makers and policy makers, or they don't speak the right language to be able to have an entry point into the system. Now that's where you could change the planning system to allow those constituencies, those voices, to have a greater say in the process. It doesn't mean to say you delegate power to them, and some of them won't, won't want power, but they have a legitimate greater role and voice in questioning some of those things. And you then could uh, uh, differentiate between matters of strategy, matters of policy, matters of principle, and matters of design, and define those limits about what's feasible um, as well. Any form of enhancing the voice of the community in any sort of political process, I think, is a good thing. The question is, can it be adequately resourced? So it's all very well designing a new system which allows a greater voice uh, of groups, people, citizens, um, but um, do they have access to the right intelligence? Do they have access to the right information to be able to challenge some of the points on the table? And that's where, to be fair, the government has put in a lot of money through planning aid to provide professional support to those communities and individuals that might not otherwise be able to afford the services of your good selves. Okay, so there is a, a, a level that's gone in, multi-million pound uh, uh, resourcing of community support 
forward to, to, to uh, have their voice in the system, but also to make sure they can uh, uh, access that um, power as well. Interestingly, some of the people who've take, come forward as part of the 21 um, to, to become neighbored for it are retired architects. Uh -oh, the yeah? <laughs> retired architects, retired planners, retired planning academics. They've all come out of the woodwork. Uh, they finally get the power that they've been craving for for so long. Um, so in some ways, you know, we could mock that, but actually that's quite useful because you do have then some people on the, on the neighborhood forum with some professional awareness of some of the issues and how to use that intelligence effectively in the process that they created. The last thing I'll say is, back to the middle tier again, um, we've dispensed with regionalism, it's never going to come back. We will next have city regionalism. Mm. And uh, the coalition has already announced the devolvement of um, uh, £20 billion worth of budget to Manchester. And every core city uh, can bid for the same amount of resources, a chunk of the central government spend in the city. It will go to the city if that city wants it, with one condition that they have uh, metropolitan wide mayors. Okay. And we, yes, we, we do, I do, I'm terrible, <laughs> terrible no. MC, we've run out no, of time, no, just, so. Uh, just one big question, what Mike was talking about. Um, a lot of people think uh, London works well because the Mayor of London and he seems to, the boroughs seem to be involved with that and it seems to work. My question is, and it's probably to the Minister as much as anything, <laughs> uh, should there be a uh, Minister for Sydney. I won't say the Mayor of Sydney, a Minister for Sydney. We've got a Minister for Western Sydney, which we never hear, I don't know what they do, but the, a Minister for Sydney um, with a staff, with a, with a, yeah, a group, um, that can pull all that together, pull the sub regions of the city, and the city is Sydney. Is that, a, is that a model or is that... We, we yeah. had that because we've tried it all in the UK. We had that model as well <laughs> under the <laughs> Labour administration where a minister in, 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 in... All the spending departments were allocated additionally a minister for a particular core city, irrespective of whether they represented that city. In fact, if they didn't represent a the city, then they were eligible for it because of con conflicts of interest. Um, so we had that model. Um, the coalition government abolished that model except retain the Minister for London alongside uh, the Mayor for London uh, because central government has too much vested interest in London uh, to leave it go completely. Uh, so it's okay, for, um, uh, it's okay for a comedian to run a city. Of course. I have Peter. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, well, look, most of what I was going to say has been covered since I put my hand up. But um, one, of the, one of the issues in terms of community debate and, and public participation, it seems to me, is an educative role on, on that debate, because some of the debate is very naive, some of it is very sophisticated, but it's incredibly variable. And um, for example, uh, the, the issue of density, which we all wrestle with, I so often get from non-members of the profession who talk to me, friends and colleagues, the debate about density always seems to be about high rise. Uh, no discussion about anything but high rise. You know, we don't want high rise. And I point out to them, well, you know, Paddington's five times denser than Cherry Brook, and Potts Point is two and a half times denser than Paddington. These are very livable places, lots of other issues tied to them, I know. But the debate seems to be quite unsophisticated in some, reg some regards, and so there seems to be an educative role in that. The other part that doesn't get talked about is density doesn't get tied to the public realm, and the fact that if you're going to have density and you increase on one hand, you have to do the other hand of looking after your public realm, creating your public spaces, creating your, your soft and hard infrastructure, social infrastructure that goes with those things. And the debate doesn't seem to get there. It seems to stop around, we don't want it or we don't understand it. And I just wonder about the educative role of our professions in joining the debate. You know, we laugh about the retired architects and planners who join the committees, but at least they might bring some levels of understanding to those to, to, to broader issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so those things. I was going to talk, there's another whole issue about democracy and democracy as it sits in Australia. But the other thing tied to density is, of course, the one that we've all talked about, but never, I mean, none of us have got the right answer on it, 
is the land value issue because as you change density with the stroke of a pen, as you change land use with the stroke of a pen, decision. you massively create wealth. Mm. And government's very good with that stroke of the pen at creating wealth, and in my experience, very poor at capturing that wealth to redistribute it to the community in, in other ways. And so that's part of the education game as well. And so when you get communities involved and in saying, we do what we don't want, the understanding is when you do, you also gain something, but we have to have the mechanisms to explain how that gain is then manifested back for the public good. And, uh, um, Marcus is really good on, on that sort of uh, issue, but I'm going to move straight, take that as a comment and, and okay. move. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> That's okay, any time. Um, and move to a comment over here. Mine is a little bit more segue, perhaps. And I want to thank <laughs> Luca for his visuality tonight and that great image of the jacket and all of the people looking towards, you know, the person, which is perhaps the first narcissistic image ever made. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and I wonder whether an Australian selfie, version <laughs> of that might be the David Moore photograph of the migrants on the boat looking, you know, off in their different directions and what the future might hold. And I guess trying to loop that with what Bob's saying, perhaps the Minister for Sydney might wear that kind of a jacket. Does he look out? <laughs> and the topic that we talk about, if he's wearing that jacket, and I'm surprised it hasn't been mentioned here in a debate on Sydney tonight, is that what would he think about drop the bomb, a second Sydney airport, and how does that change stuff? And who gets to talk about that? Is that what level of democracy are we allowed to actually have that debate? So that's a bit of a comment, but um, I want to thank the visuality, and I, I guess I want to broaden that debate to transport and, and things that might change our city. Just on the visuality thing, and I'm sure Luca would appreciate this, in the uh, town hall in Siena, uh, there is, there is, there, in the palazzo there, there is, there's a beautiful fresco which is a uh, sort of a parable about good and bad governance, yes, yes. which is quite amazing. Good always rises over evil. Yeah, but it shows, you know, in bad governance, all the people impoverished and starving, and then, you know, it's all glowing. And the... Marcus, I was going to say, uh, in light of Luca's comment about the Magna Carta, Hammurabi, 3,750 years ago, said that the role of government was to protect the powerless from the powerful. <laughs> 3,750 years ago. We have one more comment over here. Uh, just a comment. Uh, firstly, it's, it's very refreshing to see planners and architects talking about democracy. It's, it's something I didn't expect coming tonight. <laughs> I. Um, I was reminded of a youth forum where some 14-year-olds were describing government and I hate to use the Australian sport analogy but as one of the kids said, good government is like good umpiring. The best umpiring is you don't see it but you know it's there. And I'm wondering if the, the integrity of planning is what everyone's here about. If, and the kid actually said that everyone actually knows the rules, they just need a government to enforce them when they step out of line. But you all have good umpires and bad umpires. Bad umpires don't get us back, the good umpires and umpire grand finals. So it was kind of an interesting discussion with these 14 year old kids in Dandenong High School. Um, but, and I like the fact that we've got a minister here who talks about a, a, a deficit, a democracy deficit. There's an awareness out there, and I think there's a thirst for government to lead. And I think that the re election of this government, where there's an agenda, and I think there's a, a capacity for them to make decisions is kind of refreshing and I'm hopeful that the Minister can be a good umpire, step in and not interfere but allowing the game to flow because the best, best sporting occasions are when they flow and when it takes its own momentum. So that's just a comment. Thank you very much indeed and it's a, probably a segue to bring tonight's formal um, session to, to an end. <laughs>